What's up, everyone? Chris Manning here from the Lockdown Cavs podcast with my co-host, Evan Damerl. On today's show for Tuesday, July 12th, we're looking back at the Cavs extending their own draft picks amid what is happening and not happening with Colin Sexton. Segment one, the Kyrie Irving extension. Segment two, the Tristan Thompson extension. In segment three, why the Cavs historically have not extended many of their own draft picks and how Colin Sexton is stuck in the middle. I want to thank you for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. Remember, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. All right, the music heard on the way in, at least in audio form, is from our friends at Astro Radio. Check them out on Spotify or Apple Music. I'm Chris Manning, covering the Cavs and NBA for places like Diamond Up Rocks and Espy Nation's Fear the Sword. My co-host is Evan Damerl, Damerl primarily at Facebook's Right Down Euclid. Evan, today we're going to talk about Cavs rookie extensions. The one I will note is that we are not going to talk about LeBron James back in 2006 because that was an old CBA. That was a very different circumstance. So we're going to start with Kyrie Irving. But I want to mm-hmm. note, the Cavs have only extended four picks of their own in the Dan Gilbert era. Kyrie Irving, Tristan Thompson, Darius, and LeBron. LeBron was a Gordon Gun draft pick, so the only picks of the Gilbert era they've extended are Kyrie, Thompson, and Darius. Those are guys picked under the Dan Gilbert era. Colin yeah, Sexton. J- J- Jared Allen doesn't fall under that umbrella yes, necessarily. Ex- yes. So that's where we're at with this. Uh, don't know what's going to happen with Colin Sexton, but Evan, let, you wanna, let's start with Kyrie Irving. Yeah, let's. I mean, when I. F- full disclosure, folks, when I open tonight's script, or today's script, I should say, and I see segment named Kyrie Irving, I thought, Chris, are we really going to uh, kick this can of worms? But. Kyrie at the time felt like a no-brainer of an extension, and obviously with the power of hindsight, it it became a no-brainer of an extension for the Cavs. Um, There was obviously some questions about him, especially with with the Dion Waiters side of things, too, but he was a no-hesitation. Yeah, but he was a no-hesitation, like, high level extension um it's not quite the max, but it had a player option, as you noted. It was five years, 90 million at the time, but like pretty decent money for a guard on your team and a young guard had a lot of unproven certainties about him too yeah so this is <clears throat> excuse me an obviously a different era of Kyrie Irving he signed in 2014 this he didn't the, open his mind's eye yet is what Chris is well, saying at least at least had to be known so signed in 2014 this is the summer of the Wiggins pick this is hiring David Blatt this deal was signed before LeBron had come back. I went back and read some of the write-ups on it, and then some of them had noted in context that they'd also like dumped Tyler Seller and Sergei Karasev and cleared cap space to maybe also bring in LeBron the same summer they gave Kyrie this extension. This was a five-year, as I've noted, $90 million contract, so not quite the max for this time. Also had a player option for last year. If you read the reporting on it, Evan, when I went back and did this, it seems mm-hmm. like, number one, there was the Dan Gilbert tweet that was like, this is a max we have him for six the next six years technically that was kind of true but like doesn't totally pass like the 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 fact checking yeah Kyrie basically gave up like seven million dollars to have a player option in the last year you could have had seven million more guaranteed but it gets a player option and it's also just like funny how like this wasn't really realistically like that long ago it's like eight years and like Darius Garland's contract for five years the five-year max he got is uh a hundred million dollars more <laughs> like yeah just, wow that's TV money changes a lot of things, man. I think the NBA has grown quite a bit since Kyrie signed that extension with Cleveland many, many moons ago. Yeah, it doesn't feel that long ago. I do remember like the memes and the videos Kyrie was like posting on social at the time when it when he signed that extension with the Cavs. Um, but more than anything, I think it's just when you look at like Garland. If you want to draw a parallel between Garland and Kyrie, like these were both deals the Cavs kind of wrapped up right away into free agency Mm -hmm. and to indicate like hey Kyrie hey Darius you are arguably the face of our franchise in Kyrie's case or in Darius's case one of the three pillars that hold up this franchise and also one of the key faces but we we view you as our franchise guard and we are going to treat you and pay you as such and they took care of it right away so like that's just kind of where the through line is between those two in my opinion yeah I agree and then as you noted, this is, this gets done because it's no brainer. He was no more yeah. overall pick. He's coming off a twenty and six season. He played a career high number of games that previous season up to that point. He, he was, was not the a fan of Mike Brown, but no, but like, look that uh, that 
that that was a weird hire, and there's a lot of context of how weird the Cavs were at this uh, singular point in time. Evan, I think the lesson here is that like Kyrie was like the catalyst of what they wanted to build, so they yeah. did it. Obviously, like the LeBron thing shifts this, and then Kyrie becomes one of the dual engines, like the 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 B engine to LeBron's A engine of them winning a title and being really good mm-hmm. for those couple seasons. But like he's coming off these three seasons, you're betting he's going to get better. You give up a little bit of team control, obviously the back end of the steal, but you had a lot of control on Kyrie going forward, and you're betting on him getting better as your number one pick just three years before. Like This is the kind of thing where it's just like you stare at it, you look at it in retrospect, and it's like, of course he got this money. Like the, This isn't a surprise, and when we're thinking about these, this is in the, the box of like no-brainers, it gets done, the player gets basically the most amount of money possible, and yeah. you move on. Yeah, no, that, that that's a good way to put it. And I think also, like you said, for context, Kyrie signed this extension before the yep. Cavs necessarily had like a firm plan to bring LeBron back. I think the option originally was Gordon Hayward. And if you remember when we did the book reading of Return of the King with from McMenamin, uh, Wendy and others that they actually had Gordon Hayward like touring the Cleveland practice facility and like talking with the front office when LeBron gave indication that he wants to come back and they kind of politely saw the the end of the meeting with Gordon but didn't really follow up with him on it because Hayward many years later joked when he and Kyrie on the Celtics saying like hey we were supposed to play together in Cleveland but obviously a little murky as to that the Jazz could have offered him any offer sheet yeah, that he the was rest- uh, cash yeah, through his yeah, way yeah, but yeah, he was restricted and all that so it complicated it so a little complicated there but I think that was and also just for context again like they just drafted Andrew Wiggins and David Blatt was hired with the, you know, the notion that, hey, you're going to be coaching this pretty young team of Kyrie Irving, Deion Waiters, Andrew Wiggins, Anthony Bennett, even though he, we kind of knew he was a bit of a bust, but there's still hope. Tyler Zeller, uh, Alonzo G, so on and so forth. But then the Cavs started kind of shedding salary, obviously, to make some maneuvers to clear the runway for one King James and Kevin Love. But this, like you said, when we've said a few times, this was a no-brainer of a signing. Kyrie was coming off a 26 season. They almost made the playoffs that year because I remember I was interning in Indiana at the time, and they lost to the Phoenix Suns like really late in the season. That eliminated from them from the playoffs. But Kyrie was really showcasing in his game that he was able to elevate a supporting cast, especially like a mentally checked out Lou Aldang and <laughs> Spencer Hawes, who was like good at times, but also just objectively terrible on defense too. But good at times on offense but like Kyrie was the catalyst he was the engine that ever made everything work and go and then obviously just like the overabundance of young players around him um it is an interesting like thought exercise like what could have been if LeBron didn't come back um like with the fighter pilot and Kyrie and everybody else but um yeah it's interesting it would have been interesting, but Kyrie, like in terms of free agency decisions, this felt like a no-brainer at the time. Like I think there were obviously concerns in terms of health and like can he elevate a team and is he a true point guard, et cetera, et cetera. But like you said, he comes back, he's like honestly the perfect co-star for LeBron, other than maybe that one season in the bubble with Anthony Davis. But like you, you have like tangible evidence because Dwayne Wade's body started to break down in the Heatles era too. Um, that this was a pretty successful run for the Cavs and Kyrie is kind of the catalyst behind it and also I think maybe the financial structure of his contract also made things a little easier for Cleveland when they had to make some bigger signings down the pipeline I mean most importantly like they just threw the money at the very good player and, and they, yeah that, well, that, they, 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 had, they had a certain commodity in front of them they had drafted and developed and they threw money at him because he was worth every penny because there was still room for him to grow and clearly a couple, two years later they're, they're, he helped them win a championship so yeah, this you were betting on Kyrie here. You're betting on the production you saw getting better. That's I think the plus from this. I we I, I don't want to. We're not gonna do. We'll do story time in August when we have like nothing else to talk about. But I weirdly have like a very firm memory of where I was when I found out Spencer Hawes. Like when that came through, like the Woj bomb came through because tre- like Trevor Magnani called me, and like I had to go into a class where I couldn't use my phone. But maybe like we'll do like weird trade st- reflection time in August when we have nothing else to talk about. That's bring like, like, we'll bring Father Trevor on to recant the story too, because a lot's changed for Trevor since we last had him on. Yeah, we were. Yeah, well, I mean, like, think about all the weird trades we could talk about. We could talk about like Luol Deng, Luol Deng, talk about, and how Evan bought a jersey for it. But <laughs> talk about like Andrew, the the Andrew Bynum standing ovation he got during that when he checked in during the season opener against the Nets uh, that season. He was a Cavalier. Like, there's a, there's a lot of like weird stuff we could really dive into in this area oh, that might super, be worth some super. Some, Odd stuff. We're bringing back Mike Brown and saving face on that, then firing him immediately after. I mean, David Blatt is just 
fascinating in general but no. this is a contract episode and yeah when you look at guys like Kyrie Irving this is a no-brainer signing and yeah you didn't offer him the full max despite what Dan Gilbert said but you offered him something pretty darn close to it in the end because that I think like Chris noted like Kyrie sacrificed the seven million dollars to have financial flexibility at the end of his contract yeah, so he can a, make the decision yeah. and maybe pull the plug on Cleveland if he wasn't feeling it at that point if he was still here bingo which did happen. All right. After the break, though, we're going to talk about Tristan Thompson, whose contract played out very differently in that career. Same draft class, obviously, both were on the 2016 title team, but that one functioned differently. And I think that's the one, Evan, that if we're going to look at lessons for now, that's almost the one that appeals to me more in thinking about this. But first, going to mm-hmm. tell everyone about our friends at Built Bar. Built Bar, Brownie Chunk, Built Bars are great. But guess what? They've given Coconut Brownie Chunk Puffs. The, they've given the coconut brownie chunk bars the puff treatment. That's right. The coconut brownie chunk built bar flavors you love in a deliciously chewy marshmallow covered in 100% real chocolate. It's just like a fluffy cloud of coconut brownie goodness. But stop drooling and listen. These are good for you. Low calorie, low sugar, high protein, and all delicious. The brownie chunk puffs are only here for a limited time, so go to built.com now to make sure you don't miss out. They're going fast because they taste amazing. All Built Bars are made with collagen protein, so which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. Eat something that tastes good and is good for you. The best part about Built Puffs is, of course, that they taste amazing, but you can enjoy them guilt-free because they're actually good for you. They are the perfect treat, perfect when you've got a craving, you need to satisfy your sweet tooth, or if you need a quick, healthy snack, they're an excellent source of protein. Delicious coconut, rich wheat brownie, creamy marshmallow stop fantasizing and get to built.com to order your box of coconut brownie chunk puffs right now go to built.com use the promo code lock 15 and get 15 percent off your order again the promo code is locked 15. all right we're back here in lockdown Cavs. i'm chris that is evan let's talk about tristan thompson so evan this mm-hmm. one just played out very differently than Kyrie's. thompson does not get his deal done the year before or in the summer leading into his restricted free agency. This is, again, uh, akin more to the complex situation that we're seeing now. We'll see if it drags on that long, but it's this didn't get done right away. He doesn't no. sign his deal until October 21st of 2015. He missed all of preseason and all of training camp. Going back and reading about this uh, when we were prepping for this episode was a reminder that Thompson and his agency, which is Clutch, also Conflict's agency, also was Darius Garland's agency, also LeBron's agency. Oh, LeBron's agency, also J.R. Smith's agency. Also Jordan Clarkson's agency. Uh, they yeah. played out their leverage and and just said, we're going to like let this go as long as possible. We're going to get what he wants. They got him five years, $82 million, every penny, every penny guaranteed. Uh, Brian Windhorst, the god himself, reported at the time that it was a, a higher number than executives around the league expected him to get. That's from his ESPN write-up on this deal. Thompson, according to Windhorst, wanted a max contract of five years and $94 million, or three years of f- and $53 million to sign. The Cavs had previously offered five years, $80 million, and then the fall before this, Thompson had turned on four and $50 million. The Cavs paid a big tax bill for this. They had LeBron and Kyrie and Kevin Love. They had a window to go for it. I think the key here, Evan, is that there was no replacing Tristan Thompson. And then he goes on to be a really key part of the 2016 title team. But, like, ultimately, maybe he didn't get every penny he wanted. But he got Mm -hmm. a ton of money. And the Cavs also just, like, didn't have a way to replace him and had LeBron leveraging for him publicly as well. So Tristan Thompson is a bit of an interesting case study because he was at his core like the ultimate role player for that shit those championship Cavs teams and just those four teams that made the finals four years in a row um but you can obviously make the argument like when horse had like many executives around the league were surprised the Cavs play paid that much for him but like what thompson did like watch him against the chicago bulls in the first year lebron was back in the playoffs like he eviscerated chicago on the offensive boards and gave cleveland so many second chance opportunities he was key in Dismantling the Celtics and the Hawks at different junctures too, like made out like that's where the Joker Al Horford became his son kind of situation where Tristan Thompson just ate him apart on the glass. Like Thompson did so much. It was such a key and integral piece on defense and also at times on offense for the Cavs, just working with Kyrie and K Love and LeBron and JR and just kind of what they've assembled all together that it was obviously a little surprising if there was a little bit of sticker shock. But I think that was Rich Paul's argument though, was Thompson has always been like a solid role player, but he is vital for your team's overall success because Mozgov 
had didn't he have the knee issues in the championship era the first mm-hmm. cha- the championship year so like that's a Mozgov started the breakdown they brought in sasha Cowan, who wasn't able to do much if anything for the Cavs. like he, the Cavs yeah, were he, yeah, uh, he was equipped. not around he was not around no. did not matter the Cavs were not equipped at the big spot because of how they like structured their contracts on their cap table that love lebron and Kyrie just took up the majority of their cap sheet and that's just kind of how you look at it. if you're rich ball like that's your counter and say like listen tristan makes a lot of contributions on and makes a lot of winning plays for the Cavs. he is like, extremely underrated he makes a lot of like the lunch pail hard nose plays like that just go under unappreciated like unless like you live breathe and eat this Cavs team and like really like knows like okay this guy's really good he's also a very competent switch defender as we came to learn at times as well but in terms of just like a through line of him and Colin, I guess, like that's where you can kind of like the argument breaks down. We're like, well, we can talk about that in the final segment, but like that's that, that was the argument for Tristan. And maybe it was a little bit of an overpay of what the Cavs were wanting to pay. Like they offered five years, 80 million, like you noted. And then in the end, it was five years, 82 million. So it was two million more than what they initially wanted to pay. But if you are Rich Paul, and the Cavs, he maximized your leverage, like you said, and they had a pretty solid argument when it came to what he had. Plus, also LeBron using the media to apply public pressure to the front office made things a little harder on Cleveland, too. Yeah, I, I think like what stands out in retrospect here is that like Thompson could not have been reasonably replaced. No, there. That's what I was getting at. Is like Mozgov yeah. was breaking down, and Cowan was not going to give you that. And you cannot yeah. play Kevin Love at the five because they tried that in LeBron's last year, and it didn't work. No, like Thompson was this offensive rebounding machine. The energy level had never been higher with him. And like, they don't win the 2016 title without what he does in the finals. Like just, there's just no way it happens. Or even in that Eastern Conference run, they wouldn't have won so convincingly at times without Tristan, like just being the the, the glue guy. Yeah. Like we remember all the three point shooting and like, I think obviously Channing Fry and, and others had a really big impact, but like, Thompson had his own niche and like he ended up finding the most success he had in his career versus like finding that niche versus expanding his game like Evan do you remember the I like miss his writing because he works for the Clippers now immensely so this isn't like like laughing at him but like you remember the Lee Jenkins yeah. uh, Tristan Thompson story about like Tristan's gonna switch hands and learn how to shoot and like that never happened that, Bro, never that was the that was the fun fact on NBA 2K for the longest time that Tristan Thompson switched his shooting hands at the free throw line to make him a better free throw shooter because I remember that going into like his sophomore or third season like that was like the big storyline cuz there wasn't much else to talk about when it came to the Cavs. Yes. So he gets paid for being in his niche and there's just like all of this leverage I think pushing him to get like like again not the not the full 94 million dollar max but like 82 million dollars five years fully guaranteed like that's a pretty reasonable contract and yeah like lebron and like there's all this stuff there's probably some stuff behind the scenes we don't fully know whatever that i think also makes him unique in that like it doesn't feel as if in the market right now for a good for agent or where the Cavs are at i mean like maybe this will change closer to the season and like media day could be uncomfortable all of that like it's this is the the thompson thing was like hanging out there and like then you had like people with a ton of power on the team talking about it and like i don't like that that also just like pushes your hand a little bit if you're david griffin at that time mm-hmm. and i'm i would love to like he'll never like it'd be impossible to like for maybe like if he's ever not the Cavs, a uh, president of basketball operations and like goes to the media route which i don't even do coach this would be like a thing i would want to go i'm like what was it like mm-hmm. being in this situation when it's like you have this negotiation that is dragging on into the close to the season for a guy your team needs but you're trying to also like figure out the finances of it, and like this team at the time was the second highest roster, most expensive roster of all time. The only yeah. there's a Nets, only one Nets roster, which is like the KG Paul Pierce team and stuff that was more expensive than this, right? Like that was the truth at the time, and obviously the Warriors now spend a bunch of money and stuff, but like this was yeah. a very very expensive basketball team, and like yeah, managing that is weird. It really is interesting to think about i know griff at least publicly during his time with the media said the one contract he regretted giving out was jr smith's extension because jr stopped trying as hard in his eyes after he signed that on the dotted line and i think there is some evidence of that but i signed jr smith uh, i love uh, him uh, dearly look, uh, as a an, fan. another another moment i will never forget is the last time this again august story time but we'll never re- forget jr smith's last game 
and the hat Jordan Clarkson was wearing at that time. Unbelievable stuff. What a, what a we'll world. talk about. We'll talk about in August when we need to fill some space before training camp starts. Yes. But I think Thompson, like again, this the Kyrie, like the Kyrie extension. Maybe there's a little bit of sticker shock with it at first. I mean, especially because like this is a role player. This isn't like a bona fide star. This isn't a guy who wasn't an all star for you. But like was provided such a valuable thing to the Cavs and I think more than proved his worth after he signed that extension because he was integral in them winning the championship. He was integral in the 2016-17 Cavs, arguably like the greatest basketball, offensive basketball team of all time. Like Tristan was like the engine and the heart and soul of that team at times because he gobbled up so many offensive boards and in turn, the Cavs could continue to be bombs away from three-point range. Like we saw what they did to the Hawks in the playoffs and Tristan was the reason why they were able to do that. And and he was slowed down a little bit and in little bronze final years because of the iron man legacy and just tristan having so much mileage on his body and you saw him start to break down a little bit towards the end of that extension um but he became worth every penny in the end and i think that's just like a guy who works hard and like you said is integral to your team's overall success and then also just kind of proving it on the court like over the span of three-ish years and then being a bit of a key locker room guy in the last uh two years of his deal as well like he was pretty important to the Cavs all the way through yes i i would this is one of those things that I, th- I think we give it on then in retrospect i mean we're recording the seven uh woge bum uh doesn't seem like donovan mitchell is totally off the table anymore so that's interesting i saw i made a face i was just like oh baby that's that's a little yeah spicy so, uh, check out locked on jazz i guess if you want some insight on that or the other teams that might be wanting donovan mitchell just to, to answer wait, what wait no ask. we're giving we're giving david lock a quick screen assist go check out locked on jazz yeah go check out like <laughs> screen assist <laughs> uh the Cavs are not a donovan mitchell team would, would be my guess no. all right after the break though uh let's talk about the Cavs and Colin section being in the middle of all of this and and also just like the Cavs. not what it, does it say anything about the Cavs that they haven't extended a lot of players in the last like 20 years let's we'll talk yeah, about that yeah 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 the, the number of ex- non-extensions of their drafted players is still surprising to me but yeah we'll talk about that in a sec all right, back on lockdown, Cavs. Chris, Evan, you know the drill. So, Evan, let's start with the fact that they just haven't like drafted a, a lot of guys that they've kept, and it's not even like I like. You hit on Kyrie, and like obviously, like that worked out. You you hit on Tristan, mm. that worked out, but you missed on Dion. You missed on Anthony Bennett, Bennett obviously. And then Wiggins Wig- was a miss until he got to Golden State. But also, like you, it's not a miss because like you traded him for Kevin Love when you got LeBron James and you won the title. So, That's like, fair. I, That's yeah. fair. But like, I I think the misses that stand out it it's like you know you end up dumping Tyler Zeller, uh, who's a first round pick. You dump Sergio Karasev, who's a first round pick. Like you missed on some of these later picks, and like that that does matter. I think ultimately, if we're looking at this, that stuff does ultimately matter because even if some of those guys aren't on your best version of your team in a certain era like the hawks have like they're going to resign kevin herter they're going to resign a kongu they did resign kevin herter and then flipped them for something else uh they're going to resign deandre hunter probably like they're hitting on some other stuff the Cavs just like kind of has in the last like 20 years like have hit on lebron hit on Kyrie, hit on tristan and like those are the picks that like really matter until you get to sexton and garland and mobley wow. and maybe a coro for context, um, the Cavs have a golf in terms of picks during that LeBron era too, because Lots as Brian Windhorst said, have, yeah. as LeBron Windhorst said, LeBron doesn't care about first round picks. He'd rather maximize his potential now. And I think you saw a little bit of that, especially in the, his last year in Cleveland when they had that, you know, Brooklyn Nets pick that a lot of people were hoping would be like Luka Doncic or it would be Trey Young. And I think the Cavs were hoping that too. And they ended up getting Colin Sexton and still a hit at the eighth overall pick, just in historical context and just what he is and possibly still could be as a player. Um, and just hits like Mobley was a hit. Garland, I think you could say is a hit now because he is the highest paying contract in Cavs franchise history like Darius Garland signed a bigger contract than LeBron ever did with the Cavs I mean granted in the second era of Cavs LeBron era like he he kind of controlled that on his own but nevertheless like this is a lot of money being committed to Darius Garland and people say like oh well he's had one good year he almost got the Cavs to a play into a playoff situation like yeah but he's also just went absolutely bananas in nuclear his third year so yeah we'll call that a hit but Colin and I'm trying to handle this delicately so the hive doesn't get upset. Um, 
is an interesting player when it comes to like exciting him to an extension. He, I, he's in the middle. He's in the, he's, he's in the middle. He's, he's in like a gray area where like he's not necessarily Tristan Thompson as like a role player, where you can say like, okay, clearly this guy is an integral piece to you winning on a night to night basis, and people can point out the fact that the Cavs weren't really trying to win in Sexton's early years, and like you can also make the argument against Sexton saying like empty stats on a bad team a lot of somebody has to take those shots etc cetera, etc cetera. but he could be important to what cleveland is trying to build because there were a lot of instances especially last season when they were kind of gunning for the playoffs where um like people will point to rubio falling down or going down for the season like yes that's a key part of this too but rubio was kind of coming back down to earth to his minnesota numbers as well so i take that with a glass half empty look but there's times that when the Cavs bog down offensively and you see Colin Sexton at the end of the bench just cheering on his teammates and trying to coach and hype everyone up the best of his ability, but you're like, man, if he was out there and he was able to get the Cavs a couple easy buckets, whether it's at the rim or whether it's at the line or whether it's just from three-pointers that Colin's feeling like taking him that night, like he could be like that connector piece a little bit at least on offense that could kind of make life easier for the rest of this Cavs team because which is why they went and got Karis LeVert and it didn't work out with LeVert just because of injuries and things outside of the Cavs control but that's where it just gets kind of interesting because he could you can make an argument in that avenue saying like listen the Cavs are a playoff team but Colin could be the piece that helps push you over the edge to being a playoff team but at the same time like how much money are you willing to commit to him are you going to commit like Less than the max, but pretty darn close to it with Tristan Thompson. Absolutely not. But are you going to completely lowball and undersell him? I just think that's just the Cavs being frugal businessmen and also the clutch side of things, just refusing to blink and remaining steadfast with their arguments. So like, it's a tricky situation. I still want to say the Cavs sign him to an extension, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. It's just kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I, to me, when I think about this and I look at where we're at with the sex and thing, it just feels like a new data point to me in, in the history of Cavs working negotiations because the Tristan, this is just, this feels different than the Tristan thing. There's not a, a title window smack open right now where you just go all in. We also just like don't know exactly how, like you can feel how you want about him, be optimistic about it, uh, about him. And I think there's reason to be, right? I, we do. We just don't know exactly how he fits in what worked last year. Like we just don't. There's not data. There's not game, no. game tape deck. It is a guess. You are making a a semi-educated yeah. guess and on how he fits. Folks, for context, again, JB Bickerstaff wasn't intentionally phasing him out of the offense, but the Cavs have found something that works between Garland, Mobley, and Allen, and you continue with that going forward. And now it's on the coaching staff and Colin to figure out his fit. And we unfortunately just don't have enough data on that fit in the new like Cavs offensive dichotomy because he went down 11 games into the season. And in those 11 games, struggled at times from the floor and like just didn't look himself because we're used to seeing more of a ball dominant guard, not a guy who's used to just primarily being off ball in mm-hmm. these situations. Yeah, and I think this is, as we're going forward, I think this is this is going to continue to think be a thing we're examining because I think Okoro is heading this way. It's not as it's not the money is not going to be as high. I don't think. I don't know. Unless but, Okoro has like a dramatic leap offensively, I don't yes. think the money's going to be high. But my point is that like I think like they have extended the very obvious ones. Mm-hmm. Garland, Mobley is going to be this way. Mobley is like the day they can offer Evan Mobley the five-year rookie max. That contract is getting sl- sent via email, fax machine, whatever it is, and, and whatever pitching. year that is. Yeah. Mobley seems like the type of cat who would appreciate a carrier pitch and just pecking in his just window via, with like a, via, with, via, with a no a raven from Game of Thrones. So like, he like yeah. unpeels the scroll from the raven's leg, and he's like, okay, and then that's it. Like, yeah, just or like a, like if they print out like the PD, like whatever it is that like that's gonna happen. That's where this is headed. <laughs> Okoro is just like. You could run this out in the same way to RFA and say, test the market, bro. Like, like Baji like might end up being really solid and you lock him up at a reasonable number, but like he, and it's too early to do this with him, but it's like, he's not going to be a guy that it, it's like very clear that he's worth the max. Like, that's just probably yeah. not what he's going to be. Well, 
we talked about it the other day. Um, a scout said it to me, and I agree with this sentiment. That, like, Abaji has the potential to be a guy where, like, a team could commit part of if or their entire mid-level exception to. Like, they could pay him 9 to $10 million just as, as, like, currently he'd be, like, 9 to $10 million in the kind of situation. Like, But, like you said, not a max, max player. Yeah, so, like, they how they kind of handle some of this stuff, and Sexton is our first data point in this, I think it's really, really, really interesting. And there's just, again, like, there's not a, like, it just, I can't figure out, like, what exactly, right now, as we look at the market for this, Tristan's leverage play was, like, as, like, maybe the only roughly, and I don't even think it's perfect comparison with this. He had LeBron pushing for him back. They had no way to replace him. Chris's, Chris Haynes reporting on the time was that they were leveraging the cap boom that was coming next summer. Saying, like, we'll just go get a bigger offer next summer. And, like, trying to leverage that to kind of push up that number. I can't figure out, like, what the leverage play is for Sexton right now. And that puts him, like, that's he's like an orange being squeezed. And, like, that that is, I think, ultimately where this is at. And, and I can't think of a time where the Cavs have, had, have like, a so aggressively squeezed in this way. Yeah. Um, is that fair? No, I think that is a fair way to put it. I'm just trying to, you know, there's nowhere else away I want to put it. Like, I think that's a good way to kind of, like, just kind of, it, the discourse around this is going to be interesting. I think people are going to, like, break this down like a Zapruder film just because there's so much free time at the Cavs right now. But go outside, read a book. Yeah, go outside, touch grass, read a book, listen to some music, make some good food. Like, there's healthier ways to spend your time than arguing with people online what Colin Sexton's worth. But again not trying to upset his hive but um this will be an interesting study for the Cavs. like they they have these are kind of uncharted waters they don't really extend their players after they draft them and like people talk on the knicks for it but the, the Cavs are not much better yeah so. and the, the Cavs is the Cavs is different is they had kyrie lebron and tristan and they there is garland now and have evan mobley like yeah, that's, they have, that's the difference. They, but they, they have, have, yeah, they but have the a, Knicks have like Kemba Walker and stuff. Man, it doesn't even count, but still. Yeah, but like the Cavs didn't hit on the middle stuff. They've hit on the big stuff, and then this is like the new, not quite elite, but like pretty good. Not sure how exactly to buy this. Sorry, that's this. I don't know if this was helpful to people. But to me, this was interesting. Um, We're gonna put a pin in this conversation. And circle back to it if Colin does. Look, we, we, this this conversation has a pin in it until we get like any new data or any new reporting or and like and guess what i don't know where that's coming from right now i don't i don't know no, like what is gonna twist you, this you and i have both heard it's a standoff right now they're waiting to see who blinks first and clutch is the clutch as an agency is very very comfortable as we know historically with letting this drag out like we didn't talk about the jr smith situation but that situation dragged out quite a bit too yeah so. we, we we had a we just, we, I mentioned it on the Monday episode. We had an episode planned to maybe just do like, the Cavs history with Clutch, and I, there just really wasn't enough meat to kind of grind out 30 minutes on this. There was enough on this bone to to, to 30 minutes of meat of podcasting, um, which is, you know, a very delicious thing that I just said. And, Chris is uh, being carnivorous. That's darn right. It is. All right. Uh, that is going to be it for today. Tomorrow, we're going to do a couple things. Number one, we're going to answer two questions about the upcoming Cavs season, there's, we're going to do some like little looking ahead stuff as we kind of get out of free agency and think about team needs that we'll probably circle back to in the fall. Those questions for this first time of it. Karis LeVert's role, uh, what is that exactly? And segment two, what is the return plan for Ricky Rubio? What does that look like and all of that? We're also going to talk about the in-season tournament uh, and why it sucks, at least in my opinion. But until then, I'm Chris. That's Evan. Be well. Want a great second listen today? Go check out Locked on NBA. It'll help you get up to date on the latest news in the and rumors in the NBA in just 30 minutes. I bet you they're going to talk about Donovan Mitchell on the Wednesday show with Jake Madison and John Corrales. Locked in NBA is your daily NBA update in just 30 minutes. Check that out today. I'm Chris. That's Evan. Be well. <laughs>